Hello viewers, good day to all of you. So this is Dr. BK for you and today I am going to discuss about the front of the thigh. So our learning objectives for today would be namely the superficial fascia of the thigh. The structures which are present in the superficial fascia of the thigh, that is the cutaneous nerves and vessels and some veins, the superficial veins. Then about the lymph nodes which are present in the superficial fascia. Then we are going to discuss in detail about the deep fascia of the thigh. And finally, we are actually going to deep with the muscles in the front of the thigh. Now first of all, coming to the superficial fascia of the thigh, it has got again two layers. One is the superficial fatty layer and other one is the deep membranous layer. They both are actually continuation from the anterior abdominal wall. So deep to the skin, even in the anterior abdominal wall, you have the superficial fascia is divided into the superficial fatty layer and the deep membranous layer. There is no deep fascia in the anterior abdominal wall. Okay. Now in the superficial fascia, you have this cutaneous nerves, then you have vessels and also lymph nodes. So the nerves these are the nerves, the lateral cutaneous, then you have the medial cutaneous and the intermediate cutaneous. In some books it is also called as the anterior cutaneous nerve of the thigh. We have the femoral branch of genitofemoral nerve, ilioinguinal nerve and also a branch from the obturator nerve. Then a plexus is formed in front of the patella which is actually called as the patella plexus. The veins are mainly you see in the superficial fascia is the great saphenous vein and the small saphenous vein. Then you come across the lymph nodes, they are called as the superficial inguinal lymph nodes. So these are the structures which are seen in the superficial fascia of the lower limb. Okay. Now, coming to the cutaneous distribution. So, the area of distribution of the lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh. The lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh is actually a direct branch from the lumbar plexus. The root value would be L2, L3. It gives an anterior and a posterior division. The posterior division also supplies posteriorly, that is the gluteal region, the lateralmost part of the gluteal region. The next structure you see here the large area this is actually supplied by the anterior cutaneous or some books call it as the intermediate cutaneous nerve of thigh. This is actually a branch from the femoral nerve from the anterior division of the femoral nerve which supplies the anterior and to some extent the medial part of the thigh. Whereas anteriorly the upper part, this region is actually called as the femoral triangle. The skin of the femoral triangle will be supplied by ilioinguinal nerve and femoral branch of genitofemoral nerve. The lateral cutaneous nerve, the femoral branch of genitofemoral nerve, the ilioinguinal nerve are all directly from the lumbar plexus. Whereas the intermediate cutaneous nerve and the medial cutaneous nerve of thigh are actually branches from the femoral nerve. Okay. So the skin over the femoral triangle as I told you is supplied by the femoral branch of genital femoral nerve. We also have the genital branch of genital femoral nerve which passes through an inguinal ring, deep inguinal ring and it is going to supply the cremasteric muscle. So L1, L2. Okay. So, mainly what happens is 
then you know the cutaneous innervation and the, the root value that is from which spinal segments they are supplied by certain reflexes you have a cremasteric reflex through which you can test whether these spinal segments are intact whether they are they are cut off or intact okay so mainly in the front of that is supplied the lateral cutaneous nerve of the intermediate or it is called as anterior cutaneous nerve of thigh, then you have the medial cutaneous nerve of thigh, more medially if you do, you have a branch also from the obturator nerve. Upper part you have the ilioinguinal nerve and the femoral branch of genitofemoral nerve. So that is with respect to the front of thigh. Then in the leg you come mainly it is supplied by the common peroneal nerve, then the medial part of the leg and up to the ball of the great toe is supplied to the saphenous nerve. Then you have the superficial peroneal nerve, then the sural nerve and the deep peroneal nerve. That is the anterior aspect. Posteriorly, the large area, posterior part of the thigh is actually supplied by the posterior cutaneous nerve of the thigh. Laterally, you are able to see the lateral cutaneous nerve. And here it is actually branches from the obturator nerve. And you come below, it will be mainly supplied by the superficial peroneal nerve, then you have the sural nerve, which is supplying mainly, and you have the saphenous nerve. Okay. So, as I told you, with respect to the superficial fascia of the lower limb, it is a continuation from the abdomen. The superficial fatty layer is actually called as the campus fascia or fascia of camphor that continues downwards to the thigh. We all know that fat is a genuine content of the superficial fascia. Any region you take, mostly it is filled with fat in the superficial fascia. The deep membranous layer does not extend beyond the inguinal region. So here you have a ligament which is extending from the anterior superior iliac spine to the pubic tubercle which is called as the inguinal ligament. So along this line, the skin crease of the hip region between the abdomen and your thigh, the membranous layer of the superficial fascia is attached to the deep fascia that is the fascia lata of the thigh. So beyond that what happens is the membranous layer does not extend into the thigh. So we have seen the cutaneous nerves, then in the superficial fascia we also come across group of lymph nodes, they are called as the superficial inguinal lymph nodes. In the deeper aspect we also have deep inguinal nodes. The superficial inguinal nodes are actually present as two sets, one is the vertical set and other one is the horizontal set. So you have the horizontal and the vertical set. The horizontal set is actually called as the superior groove and they are situated below the inguinal ligament. They can again be divided into a lateral set and a medial set. The lateral set drains the lateral part of the thigh gluteal region and anterior abdominal wall lateral part of the anterior abdominal wall below the level of umbilicus. The medial set again drains mainly the medial part of the thigh anterior lateral abdominal wall medial part below the level of umbilicus. Then it also drains the external genitalia that is the penis and the scrotum in case of males, vulva and vagina in case of females. Then perineum and lower part of anal canal below the pectinate line. So these are the area of drainage of the upper group or the superior group of the inguinal lymph nodes that is the superficial inguinal lymph nodes. When you come across the vertical set which is present along the termination of the great saphenous vein, 
they drain the whole of the upper limb, the anterior part and the medial part, except those regions along the small saphenous vein. So, lymphatics over the small saphenous vein they drain into the popliteal lymph nodes, whereas the remaining lymphatics drain into the inferior group of the superficial group of inguinal lymph nodes. The efferent lymphatics from here will go to the external iliac nodes. So they might directly go to the external iliac nodes or on their way sometimes they might be intercepted by the deep inguinal nodes and from there they might reach their destination. So because of this arrangement and the directly or sometimes indirectly they go. Any hernia that is the femoral hernia, the lymphatics are not obstructed. Okay. So that is the area of drainage of superficial inguinal lymph nodes. So mainly they drain the whole of the upper limb you should remember. Then mainly they drain your anterior abdominal below the level of umbilicus and they also drain the external genitalia. Now coming to the, we have seen about the cutaneous nerves and then we have seen about the lymphatics that is the superficial group of lymphatics. The veins, mainly what we see is the longest vein in our body that is the great saphenous vein. It actually starts from the dorsal venous network medially and then ascends behind the medial malleolus in the medial part of the leg. Then behind the knee and curves upwards and finally from the medial side of the thigh comes to the anterior side in the upper part of the thigh and ends into the femoral vein by passing through the saphenous opening and piercing a fascia, the cribriform fascia. Okay? So it pierces the deep fascia and then opens into the femoral vein. So at or prior to its opening it also receives some tributaries, the three tributaries you are see here superficial circumflex iliac, superficial epigastric and superficial external pudental. So these are some of the tributaries the great saphenous vein receives prior to its termination into the femoral vein. Okay. So that is the superficial external pudental, superficial circumflex iliac and superficial epigastric, these three tributaries. One goes laterally, one goes above and one goes medium. Okay. So in short only we are seeing the great saphenous vein because the venous drainage of the lower limb is again a very very important topic which will be dealt separately. So that is the diagrammatic representation of the great saphenous vein for you from the medial end of the dorsal venous arch. Then it passes medially behind the knee and then comes to the anterior part where it receives the three veins before terminating into the femoral vein. So superficial so epigastric, external ponental and circumflex iliac veins. You also have an accessory saphenous vein, sometimes not always present and you should remember that the veins are more prone for variations. The only thing a variation gains importance when there is and interference in their function. So that is how it pierces the deep fascia of the thigh to enter into the femoral vein and that opening is actually called as the saphenous opening. So now we come to the next aspect, the very important is the fascia later of the thigh which is the deep fascia of the thigh. It is called as the fascia lata or the deep fascia of the thigh. It tightly invests the thigh like a sleeve or you can call it as a stocking. So stocking is a very long socks, you wear it up to the knee region. So like that, like a stocking or a sleeve, it tightly invests the thigh. Now you might wonder why actually it is tightly investing the thigh, the muscles mainly because if it is not tight, then this muscles might bulge out mainly during weight bearing or various activities. 
because these muscles are under the constant pressure while walking or standing or running due to the weight bear so that is one reason it is very tightly investing the thigh the second reason is because of this tight investment it aids in the venous return so because all the weights are running upwards against the gravity so naturally what happens is they need a lot of effort and pressure to pop the blood against the gravity and push upwards okay so to do these two reasons the fascia lata of the thigh tightly invests the thigh now here on the upper part of the thigh it is attached to the pubic tubercle lower part of the inguinal ligament so because it is attached to the lower surface or inferior surface of the inguinal ligament the inguinal ligament itself is not a straight line as shown here it is somewhat gutter shape because due to the constant pull of the fascia lata of the thigh from below then it is attached to the whole length of the iliac crest then it is attached to the posterior surface of the sacrum sacrotuberous ligament ischial tuberosity then from there if you look more anteriorly it comes it attaches to the conjoint ischiopubic ramus then it passes over the pectineus and gets attached to the pecten pubis of the pectineal line now if you look the region where it is getting attached to the pecten pubis or pectineal line that is which is present in front of this muscle pectineus it is somewhat at a more inferior plane so the whole fascia lata is at one plane and the median most part upper medial part is at the inferior plane okay so we will also come to see that after some time so that is the fascia lata of thigh for you how it completely invest the thigh inferiorly it is attached to the patella and it is also attached to the lower part of the condyles of the tibia and also to the head of the fibula the fascia lata of the thigh now any deep fascia may modifications you can see the intramuscular septum the other two modifications that is the saphenous opening and the iliotibial tract we will come to it after some time so from the deeper aspects the deep fascia of the thigh gives extensions which is going to get attached to the bone as three intramuscular septa one is the medial intramuscular septum other one is the lateral intramuscular septum and then you have the posterior intramuscular septum the medial intramuscular septum is attached to the medial lip of linea aspera and also to the supracondylar line the lateral intramuscular septum is going to attach to the lateral lip of linea aspera and also to the supracondylar line lateral supracondylar ridge the posterior intramuscular septum what happens is attaches to the intermediate area or the intermediate lip of linea aspera so between the medial and the posterior intramuscular septum you have the adductor group of muscles between the posterior and the lateral intramuscular septum you have the flexor group of muscles the muscles of the back of the thigh between the medial and lateral intramuscular septum you have the extensor group of muscles or the anterior muscles compartment of the thigh so three intramuscular septa there may giving rise to three groups of muscles in the thigh they also contain the respective vessels and nerves okay oh. so i have already discuss about this in the previous slide so how medially what happens on the medial edge of the fascia covering the pectineus muscle and up to the pecten pubis now we are able to see an opening in the deep fascia of the thigh this is actually called as the saphenous opening 
because it is pierced by the gates of venous vein to get terminated into the femoral vein. That is why it is actually called as the saphenous opening. So, a deficiency in the deep fascia, it is 4 cm below and lateral to the pubic tubercle. So, that is the surface mark. 4 cm below and lateral to the pubic tubercle. Okay. So, it is very important landmark uh, mainly for embalming of the cadavers. Usually, the embalming fluid is injected into the femoral vein. Okay. So, embalming is a procedure when you want to preserve the dead bodies for some time. So, it is done for many reasons. One is if they want to take the, the dead person, airlift the person for a very long period, they want to travel to a very long distance or if the body is to be preserved for more than two or three days. And mostly in the western countries, embalming is usually a common procedure which is done. Mainly it is done in the femoral triangle. You identify the femoral nerve, femoral artery mainly. And what happens, a cannula is injected into the femoral artery. And then the embalming fluid is injected. It is a combination of uh, formaldehyde and some amount of glycerin and alcohol is also mixed along with it. Okay. So, the saphenous opening is present 4 cm inferior and lateral to the pubic tubercle. If you look at the margins of the saphenous opening, it is also called as the falciform margin, that is the upper margin, the lateral and the inferior margin is very sharp and it is actually called as the falciform margin and it presents anterior to the femoral <coughs> vessels. Okay. So, it presents in front of the femoral vessels whereas if you look at the medial margin, it is present at a bit deeper plane and it is passing behind the femoral vessels. So, if you look almost it is like a double breasted jacket. Now, this gap is again filled by a fascia which is called as the cribriform fascia, which means cribriform is sieve like, like a filter you have in the tap, you put a filter to the tap, opening of the tap so that it filters some impurities. You see a lot of holes, sieve like in the same way. This fascia which is covering the saphenous opening is called a scribriform fascia. Why so many openings is because it is pierced by so many structures. The structures piercing the scribriform fascia will be the branches from the femoral artery, three veins I told you, the superficial veins of the great saphenous vein. Of the same name these arteries will be there superficial external portal artery, superficial epigastric artery, superficial circumflex artery. So, these three the pierce, then it is pierced by the lymphatics and it is also pierced by the cutaneous nerves. Okay. Then what about these three veins, the corresponding veins, superficial circumflex cilia, superficial external portal and superficial epigastric veins. Uh, these three veins, some books they tell it passes to the cribriform fascia, but some authors they do not agree. They tell it does not pierce the cribriform fascia. Yeah. So, that is the saphenous opening for you, whereas the upper lateral and the inferior margins are very sharp and it is called as the falciform margin. Then the medial margin is actually somewhat passed in a deeper plane in front of the pectineus going attached to the pectineal line or pectin pudis, it is behind the femoral vessels, whereas this part lies in front of the femoral vessels. The next modification of the deep fascia, we have seen first the intramuscular septum. The second one we have seen is the saphenous opening, 
The third one is actually called as the aotibial tract. So here we are able to see the aotibial tract. It's a modification of the deep fascia. Thick band we are able to see in the lateral side of the thigh, extending from the iliac crest and going to the lateral condyle of the tibia. So from the tubercle of iliac crest to the lateral condyle of tibia, what you see is the iliotibial tract. The iliotibial tract actually splits to enclose two muscles you are able to see here. One is it completely splits to enclose the tensor fascia nata muscle anterior. And posteriorly it receives the three fourth fibers of the gluteus maximus muscle. Okay, so posteriorly it receives the gluteus maximus muscle. Anteriorly it receives the tensor fascia muscle. So if you look the superficial layer of iliotibial tract goes to the iliac crest. Okay. So the deep part actually merges with the capsule of the hip joint. Not only that, the deep fascia also gives an aponeurotic sheath between these muscles and the gluteus muscle and called as the gluteal aponeurosis between the gluteus maximus at the superficial plane and the gluteus medius and minimus at the deeper plane. Between these two, you also have the gluteal aponeurosis which is formed by the extension of the fascia lata of the thigh. So the main function of the iliotibial tract is stabilizing the knee when you are standing. So in an extended knee, it stabilizes the knee because it passes in front of the line of flexion. When walking or running in a semi-flexed knee, so what happens in the semi-flexed knee? It passes behind the line of flexion as that what happens is it is getting tensed. When this is getting tensed, naturally it helps to extend the gluteus maximus and increase the force of the gluteus maximus through which it again stabilizes the knee. Okay? So, in any case, what happens? It prevents the anterior dislocation of the thigh over the knee, that means the femur over the tibia. So, that is the main function of the iliotibial tract. Now, how actually the structures enter the thigh? Now, you know, this is the inguinal ligament. And below you see the hip bone. Between the hip bone and the inguinal ligament, there is a very narrow gap through which the structures are going to enter. This narrow gap, the lateral part can be, this gap is actually called as the lacuna musculorum. So, anterior lateral part of the inguinal ligament, ilium, you have the posterolaterally, and medially, what you have the iliopecunial arch. So, contents mainly iliopsoas muscle, iliacus and psoas major, they unite to form a common tendon. Then the femoral nerve and lateral cutaneous nerve or lateral femoral cutaneous nerve of thigh. So, these are the structures which are emerging from the lacunae musculorum. The medial part, the gap is actually called as the lacunae rastulorum. The boundaries are an anterior medial part of the inguinal ligament. Posteriorly, you have the fascia covering the pectineous muscle. This is the pectineous muscle and the fascia covering the pectineous muscle and the pectineal ligament. Medially, you have one more ligament which is called as the lacunar ligament. And laterally, the iliopectineal arc. The contents are the femoral sheath which encloses your femoral artery and vein. And medially, what you have is the femoral ring and a small nerve which is the genital branch of genitofemoral nerve. So mainly the femoral vessels are transmitted through the lacunae vasculorum or vasorum and they are enclosed in a sheet which is actually called as the femoral sheet. Okay. So femoral sheet and femoral triangle is again a separate and very important topic which we will be discussing in a separate lecture. Apart from that, some lymphatics also travel. So, so far I have discussed about the 
superficial structures that are the superficial fascia of the type structures present in the superficial fascia of the type then that is the cutaneous nerves superficial veins then superficial branches of the femoral artery inguinal lymph nodes superficial inguinal lymph nodes then the deep fascia of the type we have seen that most importantly the modifications of the deep fascia that is the lateral intermuscular septum the iliotibial tract and the saphenous opening now in the deep fascia what we see is the muscles of the anterior compartment of the extensor compartment of the type present most superficially immediately deep to the deep fascia is the sartorius muscle then you have these muscles which are actually called as the quadriceps femoris it is a combination of four muscles that is what is called as quadriceps femoris rectus femoris and three vastae that is vastus lateralis vastus medialis and vastus intermedius muscle then the muscles forming the floor of the post the femoral triangle iliacus pectineus and psoas major then one more muscle we see is the tensa fascia lata so these are the muscles we see in the anterior compartment of the thigh so we will try to see each and every muscle one by one so the first thing is the sartorius muscle again it is the longest muscle in our body almost 45 cm in length okay. so the 45 cm in length one is your sartorius muscle your femur is of the same length which is also the longest bone in our body arising from the anterior superior iliac spine and also from the area below it and getting inserted into the medial surface of the upper part of the tibia in front of semi tendinosus and gracilis it is a part of transarina which means crow's feet okay the main nerve supply is with the femoral nerve from the anterior division of the femoral nerve it supplies so that is the sartorius muscle for you getting inserted into the medial surface of the upper part of the shaft of the tibia the remaining lower complete lower part of the shaft of tibia is subcutaneous it does not have any muscle attachments the main action on the hip joint it is a flexor abductor and lateral rotator of the thigh okay on the knee joint it flexes and medially rotates the thigh in semi flexed position okay so it flexes and medially rotates the knee in the semi flexed position so when two sartorius they contract bilaterally naturally they are brought into the position in the tailor so that is why it is called as sartorius sarto means in latin it represents the tailor so that is why it is actually called as the sartorius muscle the next muscle quadriceps femoris the first muscle you see is the rectus femoris so the origin of the rectus femoris from the anterior inferior iliac spine it originates and it has got two heads it has got a straight head and it has also got a reflected head the straight head is the one which arises from the anterior inferior iliac spine okay and it represents the secondary head of the erector spinae group in man the reflected head it is actually arising from the acetabulum a group of the acetabulum and that is the primary attachment of the muscle which is represented in case of the quadriceps so the straight head is actually a modification of the man after gaining the erect posture now the both the heads meet and form an aponeurosis which extends on the anterior surface and what happens is the lateral part the muscle is actually bipedal so naturally we increase the force of contractions lot of muscle fibers are packed into it and finally the flattened tendon is inserted into the base of the patella 
Some fibers cross the petal and are continuous with the ligamentum petalli through which it is going to get inserted into the tibial tuberosity. That is the tuberosity of tibia. So again, it is supplied by the femoral nerve and the main action is extends the knee and flexes the thigh. So most of the muscles you see in the extensor compartment, they are extensors of the knee but the flexors of the thigh. So we go to the next muscle. So that is the rectus femoris for you, somewhat aponeurotic. Then this part is bipinnate, and finally what happens? Getting into the base and continuing as the ligamentum petalli. The three vastae muscles you are able to see here: vastus medialis, vastus intermedius, and vastus lateralis. The vastus medialis it covers the medial surface of the shaft of the femur. And takes a continuous linear origin from the lower part of the intertrochantric line, then spiral line, medial lip of linea aspera, and upper two thirds of the medial supracondylar line. The muscle slopes downwards and gets inserted into an aponeurosis on the deep surface. Some of the fibers form an expansion as the medial patella retinaculum. And through the ligamentum patella, it is going to get inserted into the tibial tuberosity. The nerve supply is by the femoral nerve, mainly the branch is actually called as the nerve to vastus medialis. It is the thickest branch of the femoral nerve and it also gives branches to the knee joint. The nerve to vastus medialis can also be seen in the adductor canal. Content that we will be dealing with the in a separate topic. So most of the proprioceptive impulses from the knee joint are actually conveyed by this nerve. Now to vastus medialis actually supplies the knee joint and also conveys the proprioceptive impulses. The action of vastus medialis it is an extensor of the knee joint or the leg. So mainly the horizontal fibers you see in the lower part they have a natural tendency to prevent the lateral displacement of patella during the extension of the knee. So thereby the stability of the patella is mainly taken care of by the vastus medialis muscle. The next muscle you see here is the vastus lateralis muscle. Again it has got a linear origin from the upper part of intertrochantric line. Then from the lower part of the greater trochanter and also from the gluteal tuberosity, lateral lip of linea aspirin, lateral supracondyla ridge, the muscle actually spirals downwards and hence an aponeurosis in the deep surface. It also gives an extension called the lateral patella retinaculum and actually it is going to get inserted into the tuberosity of the tibia in the form of ligamentum patellae. The nerve supply is by from the posterior division of the femoral nerve, branch to the nerve to vastus lateralis, and the action is, is an extensor of knee joint. The next muscle is the vastus intermedius, arises from the anterior upper two third, the whole of the anterior surface of the shaft of the femur anterior lateral surface of the femur getting inserted into the tibial tuberosity. Okay, it is also a part of the quadriceps tendon, base of the patella, and from there extending as the ligamentum patellae. Again, supplied by the posterior division of the femoral nerve, extensor of the knee joint. There is one more small muscle, what we see here is the articularis genu muscle. It is seen in the lower part of the anterior aspect. In the lower part of the anterior aspect of the shaft of the femur, it is detached part of the vastus intermedius muscle arising by three or four slips. And it is inserted into the suprapatellar bursa. The main action is it keeps the bursa in position by pulling upwards the apex of the synovial fold so that. What happens is the bursa does not get impinged during the actions of knee joint between the bones. Okay? 
so it keeps the supra patellar bursa in position impingement of the bursa during knee extension it does not get caught between the femur and the tibia so that is actually called as the articularis genu muscle for you the next muscle which we are actually going to see is the iliacus muscle the iliacus muscle arises from the iliac fossa from the ventral surface or from the iliac fossa of the ilium and also from the adjoining surface and from the area of the sacrum it is getting inserted into the lesser trochanter of femur okay so mostly a triangular muscle it joins with the tendon of the psoas major to form the common iliopsoas tendon and it is inserted into the anterior part of the lesser trochanter innervation by the trunk of the femoral nerve directly a branch from the trunk of femoral nerve it actually a flexor of hip and also a medial rotator of the thigh so it is flexion and medial rotation of the thigh so that is about the iliacus muscle the next muscle psoas major muscle long fusiform muscle it is actually a muscle of the trunk for the functional reasons getting inserted into the femur arises from the sides of the lumbar vertebrae and from the tendinous origin and also from the sides of the lumbar vertebrae along with the tendon of the iliacus it gets inserted into the anterior part of the lesser trochanter of the femur both the muscles are actually covered by a fascia the fascia iliaca the psoas major as upper part as again got a fascia which is actually the psoas fascia now near to its insertion what happens it is actually separated from the capsule of the hip joint by a bursa so the iliopsoas tendon is separated from the hip joint by a bursa so to prevent any friction so from the all the lumbar vertebrae and lesser trochanter so again it is a direct branch l1 to l3 nerve supply is supplied by from the lumbar plexus okay so action acting from above it is assisted by the iliacus and it helps in the flexor of the hip the chief flexor of the hip is the iliacus and the psoas major muscle whereas the other muscles which we have seen the rectus femoris and the vastae muscles they only assist in the flexion because they are chief extensors of the knee joint okay the iliac psoas together when the foot is off the ground when you lift the foot off the ground they are actually medial rotator of the hip okay when the foot is actually off the ground sorry actually it is a lateral rotator but when the foot is on the ground it is the medial rotator there is again a controversy with respect to the action of this iliopsoas whether it is a medial rotator or lateral rotator but when there is a fracture of the neck of the femur when there is a fracture of the neck of the femur then naturally what happens is this muscle pulls the distal fragment laterally okay so the distal fragment is rotated laterally in fractures of the neck of the femur okay so that is about the psoas major muscle and it is the chief flexor of the thigh along with the iliacus muscle the next muscle is the tensa fascia lata you are able to see here iliac crust arising and also from the anterior superior iliac spine it is getting inserted into the iliotibial tract and the nerve supply is by the gluteal nerves and the main action is flexion and abduction of the thigh <coughs> it is also a tensor of the iliotibial tract so that is what is actually called the tensor fascia lata from the deep surface of the iliotibial tract the lateral intermuscular septum is attached and the iliotibial tract sometimes is used for surgical repair 
so some tissue is actually uh, taken from the tensor fascia later also so today i have completed the front of thigh the muscles of the front of thigh prior to that i have discussed about uh, the mainly the deep fascia of the thigh one more muscle you see here is the pecunius from the pectin pubis and the pecunial line of the femur getting inserted into the pecunial line of femur from the lesser trochanter to the linea aspera you see the pecunial line of femur most medial muscle you can tell with respect to the front of thigh and also from the floor of the femoral triangle it is mainly supplied by the femoral nerve as well as the obturator nerve so you can call it as a hybrid muscle it is actually derived from the both uh, compartments so the femoral component belongs to the extensor compartment and the obturator nerve muscle it should have been migrated from the adductor compartment the main action again it adducts flexes and medially rotates the thigh so that is about the pectineus muscle main thing you have to remember it is the hybrid muscle it is supplied both by femoral nerve and obturator nerve so that's all for today we will meet again in next class thank you very much